Hello and a very warm welcome to Urban Manifesto. I'm Lucy Bullivant. I'm the founder of Urbanista.org, my web scene dedicated to livable urbanism. And together with Prathima Manohar, the founder of Urban Vision, we under lockdown launched a third digital platform uh, in order to promote happier, healthier and more livable, and that means more equitable urban futures as we transition through the pandemic into a new era. So what are the priorities, processes and identities that are needed in order to make, um, make the new era one that we really, really feel is, uh, is going to be an improvement on what we've had in the past? Well, if you stay tuned, we are going to explore them for you once again. Um, so our exceptional multidisciplinary expert speakers are chosen from many different continents and they help us to define a shared urban manifesto in order to serve as a really inspirational roadmap for more progressive, resilient and responsible urbanism. We live stream every Tuesday. We discuss each week a different urbanism theme and there are a multitude of fascinating and challenging topics demanding our attention. So we're gonna keep things running for quite some time. If you see us here in a year's time, don't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have a growing now, growing number of episodes now completed, so you can watch on our platforms at your leisure on either YouTube or Facebook. And we would like to thank once again very much the Architecture Foundation for live streaming our episodes as part of their 100 Days Studio. So over to Prathima to introduce today's theme and our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the Urban Manifesto. Our lives have dramatically changed over the last few months in ways we could not have imagined. <laughs> we can no longer meet in large parts of the world, go to work like the way we used to, or go to restaurants, movies, or even fly to a weekend vacation as we all uh, were very used to pre-COVID. Uh, the needs of distancing has changed the way people use space. These may be short term changes, but the pandemic is in a way accelerating existing trends. And uh, today developers and investors have to rethink design purpose and sustainability of buildings for the long term. So we are so thrilled to discuss this important topic of future of development in today's conversation. Um, and uh, we are so honored and thrilled to have two amazing uh, thought leaders on this team uh, joining us today. Uh, we have Surendra Hiranandani, the founder and managing director of House of Hiranandani, who's worked extensively in India and um, has been an iconic developer uh, here and he's worked in other parts of Asia and now uh, is also exploring, uh, uh, already starting working in London. And then we have Johnny Anstead, uh, who's the founding director of uh, Town, whose mission is to uh, build places that uh, you know creates happiness. And uh, uh, he's a developer that is, you know, his, whose mission is to deliver well-designed, <laughs> sustainable homes, streets, and neighborhoods. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, just you. quickly, uh, you know, how have you both been during this pandemic, Surendra? Well, uh, it's been, uh, I mean, uh, learning a new way of life, staying at home, uh, working from home, doing mm -hmm. things from home. Uh, it's been uh, a good experience. I think it's uh, been effective also. Uh, but uh, we just hope that the larger economy around us also picks up so that uh, we can uh, go back to normalcy in terms of uh, what actually happens around us. Yeah. yeah. Johnny, how have you been? Well, I think it, like everyone, I have been stuck at home, um, which in some ways has been great, spending plenty of time with my family. <laughs> You're probably end up meeting my three-year-old in a minute because he can't <laughs> be on the other side of a door yes. than me a, a lot of the time when I'm especially if I'm doing something like this um so I think like a lot of a lot of people it's had its upsides and also its challenges which 
which in some ways are the same things there uh, you know mm. it's um, it's it, it's difficult to find mm. um diff different parts of your life become very blended into a single into a single sort of package and in a way that i i haven't been used to there's been no commuting no working from london uh and uh, and it's all kind of merged and it's been quite fascinating but i think the the biggest thing for me that's that's been um sort of a, a silver lining to something that's been you know for lots of people you know really quite a, a terrible period for all, all sorts of reasons is that it's given us pause for thought to to kind of just to rethink about how we would like things to be um and whether returning to normal is what we want or whether we want to determine a new kind of normal yeah Thank you. So, you know, our, the first segment of our show is the Urban Manifesto, where we've asked both of you to prepare a three-point agenda for the future of development. So I'm going to quickly share your slides here. And um, Surinder, maybe you can start first. Um, what are your okay. thoughts on the uh, future of uh, development? I have your slides up. I think you can see. Yeah. I focused on a point which I felt had, you know, the biggest effect uh, uh, with this crisis. It, uh, we saw the decimation of high street retail due to e-commerce and uh, unfriendly tax policies and, you know, uh, has their cities have become expensive, the cost of rents were going high. Uh, but uh, COVID crisis has put uh, the high street retail in a bigger quandary and a lot of people may not recover from such crisis. Being shut for six months is easy for a government, but not easy for a private enterprise or any business enterprise for that matter. Uh, and uh, I feel that is the being the biggest effect of this crisis. And uh, it's a uh, I really fear it because there's something which I love to do whenever I do a greenfield project is high street retail, putting in convenience stores, putting in the local stores is one of my uh, highest priorities. It's so essential to ensure uh, is one of the key essentials for a good neighborhood, for a good greenfield neighborhood. If you want it to come up quickly, if you want it to be successful, if you want people there to be happy. Of course, there are other sectors which have been affected. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, but uh, we hope they are temporary, so as in hotels. I'm sure leisure travel will pick up rapidly with, you know, like a sharp rebound. Everybody is just dying to get out. As soon as they get opportunities, they feel it's comfortable to move around. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure that will recover in a very big way, but uh, yeah, long term, what, uh, I mean, what is going to affect, uh, do you want me to cover that in this question or? Uh, um, you could, I'm going to quickly move the slides. You said, uh, I, I'm just moving the slides ahead. Can you see the slides, Surendra? Yes, yes, of course I can. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, coming back to the first point, uh, I feel that, uh, you know, the luxury, uh, the high grade, uh, A grade office space, the large office spaces in urban centers in uh, the hyper gentrified cities of the world are going to be affected because uh, companies are not going to want to ha have so many employees in one location. We don't need that uh, expensive locations in a central business district. It could be distributed even within a city. So it's not just about moving to uh, outside the city, which may be uh, possible in a place like uh, USA, where suburbanization is possible and feasible infrastructure is there in uh, the suburbs. And the definition of suburbs in the US is quite different. It's really deep suburbs, it's quite distant. While when we talk in the rest of the world, suburbs is something pretty close to the downtown. Uh, we also uh, will see a huge correction in luxury real estate, and uh, uh, which is a good for the cities because uh, uh, if people, uh, if the cities become more affordable, they are going to revive again. They'll revive much quickly, much more quickly if 
there is uh, you know more affordability in the cities because there's a dying need uh, for, for the youth to live in the city uh, and we will see this trend for the youthification of uh, all the cities in the world and uh, the biggest effect will be on the hyper gentrified cities where things have become really unaffordable for the youth so this kind of changes but restaurants cafes uh, you know theaters all this i i i mean my guess is that it's temporary and it need to revive because these are things we all need as human beings social interaction you know meeting friends developing romantic relationships whatever but uh, we just need to get together and uh, um, you know that way cities will continue to thrive urban centers will continue to thrive <clears throat> yeah you want me to cover the say uh, all the three points uh, yes please <laughs> Okay. Quickly. Second point in the slide. Yeah, I put up. Yeah, the property sector. And now I'm uh, putting on my emerging market hat and talking. And uh, in any emerging market, for so any large emerging market, you know, I mean, I'm saying a country of at least 100 million. Say, you need, uh, you know, you, you for the country to grow. For the country to be prosperous, for the middle class to grow, for employment opportunities to happen, prop you need a prosperous and a thriving property sector. Uh, there is no way on earth a city, a country can come out of poverty uh, without developing uh, its property sector, without having a thriving and throbbing property sector and it's driven by the private sector uh, the you know it's the government is in planning the government is in uh, regulating the government is there to provide infrastructure but it's really a private sector initiative uh, china is a different model uh, but even there it's called uh, the state capitalism and you have the private companies who are listed who are driving the property sector so uh, if you see today in terms of China's property sector, uh, it pretty much drives gl the global economy because it's consumption of commodities, it's consumption of, uh, uh, you know, uh, goods from the whole world is so high that jobs are created and economic opportunities are created globally for the that sector. And they have it has successfully risen out of poverty to a middle class level uh, and it is still a high percentage of the economy i think it used to be 40 percent at the initial stages 20 years ago but it's still almost 20 percent of the gdp even today in the china and uh, it's uh, it's still much bigger than uh, you know most other sectors which we think are very big but the property sector is far bigger than uh, most other sectors of the economy. The third point. Um, the cities need to reduce the dependence on the private automobile. Yes, because urban planning has always been, uh, you know, uh, run by traffic engineers. And uh, the whole system of... Uh, Planning needs, I mean, it's very different in Europe, of course. In Europe, it's no more like the 60s, 70s, 80s. They have changed and uh, the planning has definitely become more people-centric, more uh, uh, human, uh, things are thought of at a human scale. People, uh, you know, commuting is thought of in terms of public transport, cycling and walking. But... Uh, in the rest of the world, especially in emerging markets, the urban planners have not understood this concept of uh, creating mixed, the importance of creating mixed use neighborhoods, the importance of the 15 minute neighborhood, the importance of the, uh, you know, the uh, sidewalk or the footpath or the pavement, whatever you want to call it, in which country you're in. The, uh, you know, these kind of things 
uh, are not even taught in colleges unfortunately we mm. still have the old corbusier thinking in colleges and uh, that holds the pride of place that old modernist thinking is part of the education system so even if an architect who's been educated a young architect goes and joins an urban planning department he comes with this baggage of this old failed ideas of uh, urbanism so uh, you know I, over here in the, the emerging markets creating this awareness amongst the planners who are who collect the taxes the government collects the taxes they are the ones who are able to lay the infrastructure they are the ones who make the laws they are the ones who you know, make the regulations and they need to be educated well on the need for uh, people centric uh, non private automobile oriented uh, urban development uh, which i think uh, you know part of your manifesto should be in that as far as emerging markets is concerned thank you surendra for kind of uh, summarizing this <laughs> radical new vision uh, for uh, future of cities and i say radical especially for places like uh, mumbai and delhi which are still very much auto centric so it's nice to see that vision for more people centric cities jani i'm i will uh, start sharing your slides now and you can uh, please share your manifesto for the future of development so sure. well i'm so pleased that my manifesto begins with the same point that surendra's manifesto finished on uh, which is all about the uh, all about the private car um and uh, in in the picture that i've chosen which is our development in in cambridge um we have a street but it's not like um it's not like most streets that you'd see in cambridge or indeed any any town or city in the uk because the simple change is that cars have very little right to use this street they can only use it other than when they need to for specific uh, mm. access to certain homes and generally it's a car free street and um uh, as as i suppose we all might imagine when you take cars out of a street it's a pretty fascinating thing to see what happens instead and uh, and actually this is uh, you know a photograph of people using a street in the way that they would like to naturally use a street if there weren't if there weren't usually you know heavy pieces of metal flying up and down the street uh, you know all, all day and all night long and um i think that for good development in the future we we're, we're coming to the stage where we fundamentally need to ask ourselves a big question about what our relationship with the car is and we've got choices to make um uh, we, we've sort of we've in the uk we've 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 uh, followed a kind of model of development over the last 50 or 60 years where everything has been geared around a certain mode of movement which has been private car movement and our land use planning and our development planning has has sort of compounded those uh you know com compounded those habits and coupled with lack of investment in other modes it's become something that's very very challenging and difficult to unpick but actually we we're, we're finding that just the maths of moving people around in the way that we're choosing to at the moment just the arithmetic doesn't work we've run out of space on the on the roads um and um you know and we and we're damaging people's quality of life and and their health by the model that we've been pursuing so actually you know i think crunch time is here we've got an environmental catastrophe awaiting for us anyway which we all know about through the um you know with climate change and actually we 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 need to re we need to reconsider our relationship to the car i'd like us to talk to talk about that in a bit more detail uh, late, later on i'm sure we will so the second point of my manifesto is uh again picking up on something that surendra said my my i've 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 picked on an image here which is the uh, 15 minute city diagram in in paris and i want to encourage us to think about cities as um kind of living and breathing organisms uh, which are quite complex in nature and uh and almost kind of human ecosystems where a lot of different things happen feed off each other and spring up and the reason why i think it's helpful to think of it as an ecosystem is is partly the variety of interdependencies 
but it's also because I think as architects and developers and other people who work in the built environment sector, we, we have a tendency to think that it's all our responsibility and that we control everything or that we should control everything. And we, we want to have a mixed use situation. So we sort of try and impose a mixed use uh, set of uses or, um, you know, we want to have good design. So we find an architect and we impose a, a building that's well designed. Actually, ecosystems don't don't work like that at all. They, they spring up. They're very spontaneous. They're self-organizing. They work only because they're because they're in balance with themselves and they adapt and adjust and they're more resilient. And I think that we need to rethink our role in, 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 in creating places as developers that we don't actually have all the answers, but actually all we're really doing is creating a, um, a sort of series of settings, a kind of set of conditions that other things can happen. And I think it's quite difficult and it's probably quite, it goes quite against our instincts, especially if we're trying to, you know, especially if almost if we have a, a clear vision, we want to sort of get the detail of it all right. and We want to actually deliver that vision ourselves, but actually our role is to set conditions for other things to happen and for things to spring up spontaneously. The third point of, uh, the third and final point of my manifesto is, um, uh, is about how we think about nature in, in our, in our, in places that we make. And um, I just wanted to share this because it's a, it, it's a picture of my son, my three-year-old, uh, who I mentioned before. He is there up a tree uh, in, in, in my garden. And, um, you know, we've got a really small garden. We live in the middle of a city. Um, we're lucky that we've got a, a bit of outdoor space. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and the fact that we have a tree in the garden is amazing. Um, and as you can see, uh, he, he's up the tree and we also feed birds in the tree. Um, you can also see in the background, there's a little bit of woodland, not very far um, from my home. Um, it's a little patch of kind of left leftover woodland. And between the thing that we have in, between the small experience of nature that we have in the garden and the sort of slightly more kind of higher level experience of woodland that we have a few minutes away. And by the way, it's, a, it's an urban neighborhood. It doesn't you know, the photo makes it probably look a bit more, um, you know, more, more naturalistic than it really is. <laughs> but we have like we have we have experiences of nature. And I, and I suppose that during um, during COVID, probably like a lot of other people, um, I have realized how dependent I am on those bits of interaction with the natural world and how for my well-being and for my son's well-being and for all of our well-being, those bits of interaction with nature are super important. And actually, it doesn't require huge kind of week long, you know, trips to the mountains or holidays to the other side of the world to experience nature. They're the little things integrated into our built environment that can sort of re-energize us. And, and you know, there's a lot of science to, um, you know, to support the idea that your, your health and well-being and your mental health in particular is supported by, you know, by green infrastructure and, and sort of moments of nature in your environment. And I think that as developers, we've been very bad at, at building in a way that, um, you know, that entangles nature into what we do because it's complex. It has management issues. It's harder to design. Um, we worry that the trees will die. We don't really like things that will cost money down the line. We like to sort of, we, we like to we like to, to, to exit a development once it's finished and trees have a terrible habit of kind of continuing to grow over time and needing management sometimes. <laughs> Um, so actually, it kind of talks to the need for developers to think about places in a much more three-dimensional way, and I mean three-dimensional through time as well as in um, in, in, in physical space. Thank you for that. I think both of you outlined what you know are essentially great places to live in. Um, so I hope that our future of uh, development is going to look like that, Lucy. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, really fascinating. And uh, I, I think I knew about Johnny's in advance, but I didn't know about uh, Surrender's in advance. What is interesting to observe is that the point at which you converge and indeed overlap quite substantially con conceptually and uh, on a pragmatic level is this notion of the 15 minute neighborhood. I also understand that Surrender is a real, uh, like Johnny, is also a real advocate 
of supporting nature and particularly um, promoting indigenous species and so on. Um, so far you haven't mentioned that, but um, so the, you've um, particularly surrenders laid out the territory. Commercial development is a balancing act and today and going into the future, it's got even to be, it has to be in order to address the climate change. It's got to reconcile our commercial viability and sustain, sustainability as well. And I do believe that I think we need, with the focus, in, renewed focus on community, we need far more, far more high, highly high quality designed uh, mixed use neighborhoods. So how can you, um, uh, promote these particular desirable trends within your own work. I mean, John is working in North Cambridge on a big site. Um, Surendra, you, you, I'm sure some of your developments uh, fit the bill very well, but how can you reconcile as we go forward? Do you have like a, a five-year plan for becoming more savvy about climate change or how, how does it work? Oh, uh, I set up my first sewage uh, treatment plant, recycling plant in 1989 before it became fashionable to talk about the environment. Okay. Oh, 100% sewage recycling in all my projects in India. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, I, since, uh, since 91, I still head the horticulture department in my organization. And I love to read books on indigenous trees, and uh, you know, uh, I I know a lot of the tropical stuff by name and uh, botanical names and things like that. And what grows well, what good on what is good on a street, what's good in a garden, what's good in a forest, what what's in a park, mm. what's good around a swimming pool, you know, things like that. So. Of course, that's it's your personal passion you put in, but uh, you know it's far easier to do it if you've got a large greenfield project, which I had the opportunity to do. Mm. Uh, you know, so we did. Uh, we had a 300-acre project, out of which was 100 acres was a quarried hill. I mean, the entire site was a quarried site. It was dug for uh, earth and metal, and uh, every, there was beyond, uh, I mean, there were uh, like seven trees on the entire site and now it's a fully wooded site and 100 acres is the largest private forestation, urban forestation program which we did uh, on the hill, uh, which was a totally barren hill. We took the recycled water up, pumped it the first two, three years and repopulated the hill uh, with trees. Now you got, you know, the Miyawaki method of plantation which is more intensive, uh, you know, and we had a big problem. In fact, uh, when this environmentalism activism started and the government got into the picture and you had the environmental officer now telling us what to do, and that became worse. And they said, you should have a space for every 15 feet, you know, between this tree, which has so, such long branches. And then uh, this species should be here. This species should be here. And uh, we knew much more than them. So, but the problem is, uh, you know, they are the regulators, you have to follow what they do. And uh, fortunately now in the last one year in India, at least I'm telling you, uh, they suddenly the, the, these guys, they discovered that the Miyawaki system works where you can plant trees five feet apart. So now we got, wow, we can actually create a more dense forest. Mm. You know, and uh, you know, so I mean, when regulators come in, they come with uh, you know the high-handedness that you know to show who we are. It's all about bureaucratic power and display, and you know we have to bow down and always say, "Yes, sir, you are right." You know, you can never argue with them, so you just have to listen. But uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, if you give a private developer the you know the I, I, you know I think private developers understand that you're going to uh, you're going to have a more uh, viable and successful development if you do these things and uh, you know the job of a developer first job of a developer is not to go bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, that, you know, that's the first job. He's got no taxes to rely upon. Mm. Nobody's going to talk good about him anyway. And nobody's going to, you know, uh, there'll be more people clapping that he went bankrupt rather than, uh, you know, crying about it. So, 
you know, you got to be careful. And uh, I, I sincerely think that doing this will make your project more successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, Johnny? How about you? So, I think that the place I would start with this is thinking about the financial model of a developer, which is kind of where I left off with my previous thoughts. Um, because I think Surendra is right. If you can, I mean, who, who, who wouldn't think that a place which is sort of sustainable, interwoven with nature, you know, nice to look at, well designed, who wouldn't think that that was a kind of more desirable and attractive place to live? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's bound to add value. It kind of has to add value because it's actually creating quality of life, which is what people want. Mm. But I think that the problem that we experience is that developers have such a short-term perspective on 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 the world in in lots of situations that they you know they want to they want to take land through planning, build something, and then sell, and they have no long-term interest. That they don't actually lots of developers don't have any exposure to the long-term performance of what they of, of, what, of what they build and I think that's a fundamental problem with the with the system if you have people who are building things that are meant to last 100 years 200 years maybe longer and they're actually incentivized to the performance of only one year at uh, the first year of those 200 years then that's going to make for a very very bad incentive uh, and a misalignment of, of of the incentive to the developer who make that you know where the profit is crystallized in year one mm. but the place actually functions in year one to 200 um, and i think that if you can't find a way of making the financial model tune in with that longer term picture then it's very difficult to have you, then then that causes difficulties right i agree uh, what uh, you said and uh, I, I gave an interview about 12 years ago when I started in 81. I started uh, you know, in this real estate in 81, that's how many years, almost 40 years ago. And uh, things have changed so much. And uh, I come from the old school, uh, which I and I did all these things. It's much more difficult today. And I said in this interview about 12 years ago, the Forbes magazine, I think, I said the, uh, the, uh, the property development has gone from the hands of the architects and engineers into the hands of the money lenders. <laughs> okay, uh, um, that's all really fascinating. I think we yeah. still need to enlarge on this, uh, explore the notion of the 15 minute neighborhood. I mean, I'm rather, I, I think uh, to um, mention um, Surendra's point about how architects are obviously still designing um, with old methodologies in some yes. cases. I think as, you're absolutely right that um, that there needs to be more focus on the the very complex uh, processes and and strategies for creating really really good 15 minute mixed use neighbourhoods. Um, but okay, so we'll leave that there. And uh, Prathima's got the next question. Thanks. You know, I, I think it's fascinating that uh, both of you uh, agreed, one, that, you know, if you delivered better places with access to nature and great place, that's just going to lead to a better outcome, even uh, as a business, right? Consumers would love to live there. Now, you, you know, both of you um, have all your project try to deliver better places. So Rendra, your work, um, you know, for the last four, five, four decades um, has been rooted in the idea of building better communities. Um, and you didn't have to do that, but you did because, you know, maybe it was a personal kind of passion, uh, you know, whether, whether it was doing the work around afforestation and investing in, um, you know, green technology very, very early on. But, uh, you know, if we can, you know, future cast a little bit more um, and think about enabling environments for this to ensure more developers think like you. Um, what kind of policies can governments have to, en to unleash this type of innovation from all of you? Um, Who are you asking? Surendra can start. Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. All right. I, I, I would put it from an emerging market perspective. Uh, there's so much to be done. No, it's a uh, it's a terrible uh, situation there, especially in a democracy like India. So it's chaotic. Uh, we got uh, first world activism combined with uh, third world bureaucratic be behavior, which you know what I mean. So. Uh, so, uh, you know, we got a combination of both. We, uh, you know, we get uh, activists who go to Harvard and come back and uh, yeah, rant and yell. And at the same time, we got uh, people at uh, dealing with the bureaucracy who's there as, uh, you know, a life mission to make their fortune. So, uh, I mean, it's a survival of a project, you know, a success of a project is the speed of approval. And uh, especially with uh, places like India, we don't have the comfort of these low interest rates. And uh, I, when I started my career, I used to borrow money. And my father was a doctor. I never had money. So I used to borrow money at 21 to 24 percent interest payable three months in advance. So... Uh, <laughs> You know, the speed of approvals can bankrupt you. Speed of uh, this, uh, it's, we need speed, we need genuine. And fortunately, in the 80s and 90s, we did have it better. But surprisingly, as regulations increased, the, you know, this uh, sort of public activism became more pronounced and uh, shrill and sharp. And as the, you know, the media got into the fray, the media found it great fodder for the headlines. Uh, then the courts got into the play. Everything has become even worse. So it's become more regulated, more bureaucratic. And, uh, you know, and there are stumbling blocks at every point. And, uh, you know, you may have all the approvals. You may have everything. And a court will just give you a stay order in the middle of your project and shut it down for six months. And then after six months, just lift the stay and uh, nobody and they don't get punished for it, as you know. So uh, it's a fragile situation for uh, and then, you know, so only the people who survive are the guys who have the reserves, the backing. So. Of course, deregulating, becoming more benign, having a softer regulation, having softer mm -hmm. on people uh, is necessary. And you have it's so easy to give broad guidelines. I mean, you don't have to micromanage the process in an emerging market where there's so much to do. I can understand in the Western world is already developed and now you're doing and you've got so much of nimbyism and... Uh, and there are other forms of nimbyism now, and uh, so, uh, but uh, you have to deal with that. So, uh, and then you have like a place like London, you have a local borough, and you land up in a wrong borough, you are doomed. You, you know, if you get your approvals in three years, you're lucky. And you go to another borough, you get it in six months. So, uh, you know, these kind of situations happen, but that's the price I think you pay for living in a democracy, which has its, you know, so yes. many advantages. So it's a tough balance. But as I said, let's start with something which you know we can do. You know, I said the education system itself is producing people which don't understand this. And you know, even if somebody asks for a report, the report is not prepared properly. You know, even if you know the at least the, you know the alignment of thinking should be there in the architectural fraternity, in the education system, in the urban planning world. I think that uh, if that is done, if there's some unanimity there, uh, uh, I think uh, that is something which, uh, you know, where we can see immediate improvement. Wow. Yep. First, I love, I mean, I love that little tagline, first world <laughs> activists and <laughs> Third world rent seeking bureaucracy. And I agree, I think we need yeah. to um, increase ease of doing business. And uh, I know that when you do development in a city like Bombay, you have to go through some 140 licenses to complete the project. So, you know, we do need to simplify some of this uh, to just 
you know deliver development so johnny the same question to you but you know your mission um, has been to deliver pieces of a great town and place right homes streets and neighborhoods and uh, in 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 the context that you work in what uh, you know what are the components that make for such places uh, to live in and you know what what makes a great place um, if you could summarize that that would be great and what kind of uh, regulative environment will uh, unleash the energy from private sector to develop these types of uh, communities okay um well it's a big i'm sure we could all talk for days about what makes a good place because we probably all have a slightly different view but we 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 probably all would agree on lots of things that make a good place too um so off the top of my head ingredients or components of a good place would be um we mentioned connections to nature places that enable where you where you can derive support from knowing other people 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 always will value local amenities back to the 15 minute city idea um for some reason estate agents and um you know how volume house builders assume that what you value in your home is the, is just you know the house itself maybe the fitted kitchen the luxury sort of elements like having an ensuite uh, but actually what people really do seem to value especially over a longer period of time is the things in their neighborhood that support their quality of life and it's not the things that are inside the home that actually drive that sort of value um that's a challenge i think to to the received wisdom of house builders people, you know because it's not lack because it's not it's not part of the thing that you're actually selling it's difficult for people to understand but those are the real things of enduring value um places where your children can grow up safely obviously um where you feel safe and places which are mixed with different people around you but where you also feel like you have something in common with people um i'm going to focus on one on on, on one bit that um around the sort of regulatory uh environment that we've that both surrender and i have talked about and it was it was both of our sort of lead surrender's lead what, what lead one of surrender's lead points which was um i think surrender you said that cities are now designed by autumn but by um by highways engineers or something similar now this is this <laughs> this talks to my experience um you know in in the uk that we have given such power to highways engineering departments um over over really every element of um you know of city planning so land use planning is very zoned because we're just assuming that people want to travel around by car from one from one yeah, land, land use to another and then at the level of a street or a road um we have tremendous sort of regulations coming from highways engineers telling us that we can't put a tree in this location because it will hinder the visibility of the highway uh, you know it will be in the in a, in a junction splay or similar or we can't plant these trees down this road because they will be you know they, they, the highways authority won't adopt them and there'll be a risk um you know the other things you know there's risks right left and center there's actually a pretty good reason why you're going to in the end pretty much do nothing of any you know that, that's good because pretty much anything that's good will challenge one of those preconceived ideas it will either carry a risk or it will carry a, a problem for you know for the car or something and i think that we have to get out of that mindset um and part of that is re i i think it would be really radical to totally reconsider how we how we you know whether, whether we really want to put streets and places in the hands of highways or authorities highways authorities i think mainly populated by you know transport engineers tremendously unrepresentative uh, as a group in terms of age and gender and um and don't and 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 we're missing a whole bunch of different perspectives we need it wouldn't it be great if instead of having highways or authorities we sort of had street teams which would look at streets in a multidisciplinary way from nature water drainage um children's play um uh, obviously movement but you know low low carbon forms of movement sociability all of those things that a street can actually do and that we want want it to do and that are critically you know the critical components of a decent place 
and actually bring those sorts of expertise together and say that's the kind you know th these will be the kind of people who design our streets in a really holistic and multidisciplinary way thinking about people and you know and, and beyond that's a great point i think um, it's mm -hmm. nice to see developers speak about uh, you know issues of urbanity so passionately so thank you for that both of you yeah, I would go as far as to say it's absolutely fun, fundamental, isn't it? And um, I've got, again, like Prathima, I've got two questions in one. So I'm just uh, juggling to, in my mind to think, consider which way to go. Um, uh, Sarendra, you work obviously work both in the developed world and the developing world. Um, and you both, am I right, you both worked in greenfield and brownfield site contexts. Um, I'm also very keen to know a little bit more about your ideas of engaging young people and uh, Surendra mentioned the whole issue of um, engaging with affordability going forward and, and making sure that our uh, spaces and places are really, really youth friendly and, and as Johnny said, absolutely child friendly. I think the first uh, one is is maybe quite a simply answered, which is uh, what are the pros and cons of working brownfield as opposed to greenfield? I think a lot of people are, haven't got really much of a clue about this, but it's quite an easy one to answer probably. Well, uh, greenfield, uh, you have to struggle with the infrastructure, you have to struggle mm -hmm. with the new location, which yeah. people have to embrace that, yes, this is going to be a great neighborhood, because when you, you create your first five structures there, nobody wants to move there. Because yeah. It's only out there, right? You've got to reach a critical mass before it really starts, uh, you know, springing to life. And, you mm. know, the trees have grown, you know, and then, you know, if you feel, you feel the, whatever you have done, you know, you get the real feel of it. And how much you need sales before you complete the second phase and the third phase and the fourth phase. Mm. So, uh, the green field is more difficult, but easier to plan in that respect because you have less baggage with you. You have a relatively clean chit, subject, of course, to the regulators, uh, what they tell you, you can do and cannot do. But you generally have a cleaner chit. And uh, it, uh, if you have the patience and you have the ability to survive the ups and downs of the property cycle and live through it, a greenfield project will, of course, be more magnificent. A brownfield project will have its limitations. It will have its nimbyism. It will have its, uh, you know, pressures from all sides to do this. And, you know, your regulations will be far more constrained. Uh, but you are in an active neighborhood already. And therefore, your first building moves. So you got that advantage. Uh, you're more viable, but probably you paid more for the land because of that. Mm. So the viability is a question at what time, at what cycle of the market you bought the land. So all yeah. these things have to be juggled with, uh, really. And uh, it's, you know, the size, of course, of the land dictates, uh, you know, how much you can do mm. to really create the environment you have to work in all situations. You can't uh, grip that, you know, I have a smaller site. Now you got to make the most of it. Obviously, if it's a bigger site, you're going mm -hmm. to be able to give, you know, much more what your heart desires. Great. Fantastic. Johnny? I surrender is much more experienced in more projects than I am. And I think that he gave a really, really good summary. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and so and so I think that the points are all the right ones. And the only one that I would add or underline is um, in in a greenfield situation, the constraints are, are much less. Of course, the infrastructure cost is higher, but the constraints are well, often higher, but the constraints are less. And actually having fewer constraints is actually a, a problem in some ways, because it means you don't um, necessarily build as densely as really you, you should do because you're not kind of trying to work in a confines of a very small site um, and you don't have the constraints that actually make design innovation happen. You're not really responding to the difficulties, but with responding to difficulties, make, make something interesting happen. Mm. So the real risk I see with greenfield developments is that they can be very bland and generic 
because actually it's very easy just to kind of deliver the same you know house types at quite low density um and that's the simplest route and so i think sometimes more constraints can be better and to do a greenfield site well i think you actually have to in invent the constraints for yourself and say this is how we're gonna you know this is the vision and you have to be much much more controlled over those things Thank you very much, both of you, for your advice. If I, I go into development myself, I would take all of it. <laughs> Don't. Welcome. Welcome to the club. <laughs> you know, I, uh, you both mentioned uh, futures uh, which are automobile free. I mean, we you're looking at, you know, you both are obviously craving cities without cars. Now, uh, you know, the coronavirus uh, pandemic actually has kind of exposed the ills of uh, autocentric cities uh, and, you know, how it adversely impacts equity, health and climate. Um, but if we were to imagine a place in the future without cars, how would that affect development? Um, um, what would it look like? You know, what would real estate development and built environment look like? in that uh, future what kind of spaces will we see for social interactions um in a community in the future without cars can we paint a little picture for our audience on that surendra would you like to start well i think uh i mean you see it all over europe now right it's uh, there for you to see uh, yeah. so uh, i mean uh, I guess uh, Europe in the last 20 years is the best example of uh, how, how it's possible to build, even though all the automobile, I mean, so many of the automobile giants come from Europe. Surprisingly, the Europeans don't buy those cars. They export them all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think uh, Europe is a great example. Now you now you got one point is that in Europe you got a great climate, so you know it's very easy to say I'm going to cycle and I'm going to walk, and then you tell somebody in Mumbai, in, uh, in the middle of summer, let's cycle and walk. He will be he'll need a shower, you know, a very healthy shower when he reaches anywhere. So, mm -hmm. uh, so you do need the public transport. You need high quality and uh, you know efficient public transport systems uh, in place which can easily come uh, considering um, the amount of money which is wasted for catering to the private automobile uh, so if the emphasis is focus changes uh, resources will be there but if you divide resources uh, and you know governments have always found it easier to Cater to the private automobile is quicker revenue. You know, ta cars are taxed, petrol, gas, whatever you want to call it, is taxed heavily. It's a source of uh, you know great revenue. You know, people are they all talking about eliminating uh, having the electric car, but I don't know how how Europe is going to balance their budgets when a substantial part of their budget comes from. Uh, you know, these ridiculously high taxes on uh, petrol and uh, diesel. So uh, let's see how it pans out. But uh, it, this is a necessary future and you'll find it even, I mean, you go to Tokyo, you go to Hong Kong, you go to New York, people don't have a driving license. And, uh, mm. and they are the great cities of the world. Eh? Mm. Uh, in London, you don't have a driving license. In Europe, you don't have a driving license if you're living in the city. You, know? you don't need one. Johnny? Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, um, whether it's a car free or a lower car existence, um, you know, it, uh, is a question, I think. But in either case, it needs it needs to be, you know, considerably changed from, from where we are today. I think the, you know, to, to answer your question about the kind of pen portrait i think the easiest way to to do that is to think about it from a child's perspective you know 50 years ago so you know two or three generations back our um you know our, our, our grandparents were able to as children they were able to explore you know vastly more uh you know on their own independently and safely than we allow them to do today today um children have 
tremendously confined existences um, because you know it's it's difficult to cross the the main road and you know it's it's unsafe. So I I think the the way I would see it is that it, it would be a you know it, the sort of environment that we're talking about is is somewhere where our children even from a young age you know very young age can experience a degree of independence without parents sort of being too anxious about it. Yes. I want to you know quickly take a moment to say hello to all the audience that is joining us from all over. I hope all of you are well and safe. Uh, if you have any questions for us, please uh, share it in the comment box below. Uh, Lucy, do you have your final question before we go into? We I've got a couple of one audience question right now, which you could go into or you could. Um, I think it's only this issue of um, what would be a, a wholly youth-friendly um, development, uh, considering what uh, Surendra was talking about, about affordability, um, because that is actually a really, really key thing going forward. I mean, you know, in terms of demographics, uh, they, you know, we need to work out better ways for designing developments for elderly people, but at the same time, uh, take a lot more attention, bring a lot more attention to the needs of children and, uh, and young people. I mean, John has said quite a lot about the youngest children. I'm, um, I'm in, in a borough of London, which is very much focused on the, the health and well-being of youth, you know, teenage people, teenagers. Um, so we're running out of time. So I'm really happy to, um, to ask uh, the audience for their question instead of mine. Yeah, so we, uh, maybe, Surendra, do you want to quickly talk about, respond to that? And I'm just going to curate the audience question. Okay. You said about the youth, right? Uh, so I'll give you a story about, this was in the 90s and I was uh, sort of the early stages of my, uh, you know, first greenfield large scale development. Uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, you know, we had elders coming to us telling us that you're doing so much for the young people, you're not doing anything for us. Yes. So, I mean, we had the parks in the gardens because we had, we put a, you know, go-karting track, we put rock climbing walls, we put, uh, you know, uh, bowling alley, we put, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, in, you know, because we had the vacant land, we just made use of the vacant land uh, until it reached the stage of development. Mm -hmm. We just got some franchises to put in, uh, you know, these facilities, and uh, we made, you know, we encourage retail, you know, restaurants and pubs to open uh, bars. We call it in India. So uh, we have. It's very easy to cater to the youth. Uh, it's for the elderly, it, uh, you know, they need, uh, I think, more social attention and you know, emerging market countries like India, you know, uh, elders live with their parents, uh, with their children, sorry. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the children, even after they're married and have children, uh, the elders live with them generally. Like I'm, you know, right now living with my daughter, so, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in my daughter's house. But anyway, so it's a very uh, it, it, it's a variation thing to do that. Uh, I guess uh, it's a cultural thing, and uh, I, I don't. Um, for the elders, I think uh, they need uh, social places where they can interact. Uh, they right. need uh, people to listen to them, talk hmm. to them. And I think you create a great street environment. Good, uh, you know parks and gardens and places mm. they can hang out and mm. perhaps organize some activities through the club clubhouse you create over there. Uh, but it's easier, you know, to have gym activities and aerobics and yoga classes and things like that rather than an activity centered around, uh, uh, you know, yeah. elder. Yeah, great. I'm 65, you know, so. You're not an elder. So, <laughs> Johnny, so, uh, what about addressing the needs of specifically teenagers and senior citizens who don't want to be removed from the wider world? Um, or indeed any senior citizens and deserves a quality of life and 
health and well-being as much as they can. Yeah, I think um, I just think as people get older, they don't change all that much. And we have in the real estate sector, we have this kind of terrible habit of kind of putting people into the segments that we that we choose to that we you know that we that we choose to put them into. Mm. Um, there he is. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Oh, about a minute. <laughs> um, uh, um, Hello. And it's, it's almost like um, we 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 make you know we we have products in mind, and the real estate sector has products that, as Surendra said earlier on, are really kind of invented by by the mm. bankers. Mm. And um, and then we try and make people fit into those categories because we because because you know we. We, we want to sell products to people that can be easily invested in and commoditized. Yeah. Whereas actually what, you know, it's people are vastly more complex than that. And or in a way simpler It's people mm. don't change that much, but their needs change. And, um, and, and certainly I, I think that as I get older, I'm not going to suddenly want to sort of be put away into a rural, you know, kind of semi, you know, isolated situation with a bunch of other old people. I'll, I'll want to carry on living my life with other, you know, with lots of other different types of people. But from an investment that. position, that's complex. Hmm. Go on, Surendra. Yeah, I agree. I fully agree. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't want to feel I'm, uh, I'm not part of... I, I still want to learn video games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that that's complicated for investors. Because How do you do it? Well, we re it's, it's all, you know. We're relying on you both to fly the flag for... Uh, in socially enlightened, uh, uh, sensitive attention to the needs of uh, more elder, old, uh, older people, let's say. What yeah, exactly? So I think you really, you really really guess it, so. what we're trying to say is that old people are no more old nowadays. You know, the baby boomers <laughs> are exactly a pretty, pretty uh, lively and active bunch. Of. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say we have a few questions. I am going to pull them so both of you can uh, potentially address them. We have one from Alva Gonzalez. Uh, as we face these types of risks, environmental factors will become increasingly uh, more important. Can this pandemic trigger a move towards large scale sustainable financing? Um, does any one of you uh, want to respond to that? Um, yeah. I think there's something interesting about um, resilience and, um, you know, the financial markets have been, you know, require resilience mm. and it's an interesting opportunity now, you know, I think the, the biggest change prompted by COVID isn't, um, you know, isn't, isn't to say how do we design or kind of like change our patterns for another COVID because the next COVID might not be COVID at all. It might be something totally different. And of course, the climate crisis is manifest in all kinds of uncertainties and sort of potential things that we haven't even thought through. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest change to the way that we think and hopefully stimulated by COVID isn't so much a design response or an investment response to COVID per se. It's about mm -hmm. how we build resilience into the way that we build cities. And I think that's that's got to be at the top of investors list now, suddenly realising that maybe the way of doing things that we've been doing so far might have made easy investment, but it isn't suitable. It doesn't accommodate shocks and it isn't resilient to to great uncertainties, and um, and so to me, that's probably the biggest lesson. It's kind of how how we can make places that are inherently more resilient, both for people and communities, but also as a financial proposition. So resiliency will become a crucial kind of decision making uh, factor for investor. That's great. We were really we have another question because we've been bashing the automobile all through the evening. Nico McDonald is asking us. Could someone say anything positive about the private automobile, <laughs> <laughs> which has to be one of the most liberating innovations of the last century, providing? So, for can I kick off on this one? Uh, yeah. I, 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 yes, of course, Nico is correct. Um, I think that I always start these conversations with an assumption that the, the that the car doesn't need anybody to stick up for it because it's so you know it's so dominant in the way that we uh, make our cities and it's such it's you know it's already the kind of you know it, it's it, it sort of doesn't need anybody to fight its corner because it is the prevailing mode so I think it's you always have to accept that when we sort of you know when we kind of fight a, a bit about against the dominance of the car it's not the car 
in and of itself uh, in all circumstances it's the dominance of it and the fact that it kind of strangles a lot of other things that would be great to have more of um and so i i, I think that as i said i tried to sort of make clear there is you know there's always going to be a role for the car all circumstances are not the same um, but we really have to do is re-examine that relationship and make it work for people. And as long as it's continuing to work for people and not against people, then fine, it's kind of passing the test. I would take issue with the assumption that it is working for people rather than against people at the moment, mm. because I, you know, even if theoretically it's very liberating, actually it's very, it, whatever the opposite of liberating is, it's kind of, its effect is the opposite of being liberating in most situations that I see in cities at the moment. Srinidhar, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it's good. I mean, you have a car, you use it for going out of the city on a weekend, you know, you take you are for emergencies, you go out in the night to take your family, you know, you got little kids for dinner. But you don't use it for daily commute, for daily things. It, it just creates gridlock. It's just, there's just, cars are too cheap. Uh, urban space is much more expensive you're wasting the urban space you just and you're just going to be living in gridlock so if you like living in traffic by all means encourage the car continue the automobiles you'll take four hours to reach your destination that's it and i think that the, the list of things that nico is put in his question uh, are all good things i mean nobody's arguing that um you know you know, th these are the things that we should be trying to do, facilitating people meeting and engaging, helping people to learn that, earn their livelihoods, mm. helping people to live their daily lives. As Surendra said, we should be trying to facilitate a full life, including romantic romance and love and friendships and all these things. And I just think, you know, we need to look really carefully at how we do that. Yes, the car might have might well have a, a role to play in doing that. But the really important thing is that we do those things as as well as we can for a maximum number of people. And, and that actually is about how we plan spaces to make those things all kind of much much more readily available actually without having without having the obligation of using a car if the only way that you can get to those basic things that you need to do every single day is your car and if that's the same for everybody then that's then then just that, that's going to make problems because we can't we can't make enough road space to, to do that comfortably for people plus i'll just end it with uh, cars are the second biggest skill of humanity after the mosquito <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's a good argument to end yeah, that's, yeah. Right. yeah that's amazing and that actually uh, is a natural cue for um saloni goyal's question um do we neglect culture when talking and planning uh, about future development because um certainly in the uk you must have noticed that um well in the states as well but i mean it probably it was originally invented in the states but the drive-in cinema has become incredibly popular my personal request is can they make sure they allow bicycles to come as well but uh, this is one way in which culture uh cinemas are starting to open in the uk soon but uh, and museums and galleries but um what is the, the question about are we neglecting culture i don't, i don't think we are but um uh, it, they, uh, culture has been in lockdown, unfortunately, and it's um, really, really uh, caused the sector to go to the edge, the brink of bankruptcy in many cases. So we, do we neglect culture? Does this question mean about uh, the when culture? Talk, of yeah, when, talking, when talking about uh, development, um, I, I've seen so many developments where they absolutely engage with beautiful, wonderful, meanwhile, cultural uh, uses so but um, it, do you see a lot of developments where culture really is neglected well you I mean you're, it's uh, your customers right if you don't uh, embrace uh, and you don't respect what they like mm. and what they are mm. how, how are you going to sell how are you going to you know, get anybody to come and stay with you I think when it's uh, a <laughs> private developer would be very sensitive about the culture uh, when a government organization, you know, like the good old days in the 60s when they built those flats and they said, you know, that purposely are thinking of creating those blocks and mm -hmm. says, oh, put affordable housing in these tower blocks, you know, talking about the European experience, mm -hmm. uh, putting them, you know, that doesn't embrace culture. So when mm -hmm. governments get in and bureaucracies get in and, you know, traffic engineers and a bureaucrat gets in, but if a private developer does it, he's going to be very sensitive. 
I mean, <laughs> he's got to survive, mm. right? <laughs> he's got to survive. He doesn't want to go bankrupt. He can <laughs> Nobody's going to save him if he goes bankrupt. No. So, Johnny, what's the role of culture in uh, mixed-use development? I mean, your North Cambridge scheme, which is a very early stage, is uh, is going to be including cultural facilities big time, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm pleased you asked about the drive-in cinema because um, we've yeah. been exploring a cycle in cinema actually um, mm -hmm. as 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 something that could be um, something that could be really interesting um, uh, as a kind of a, 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 you know a low carbon take on a on a drive-in cinema, but with you know hopefully the same levels of fun and uh, and and also being outside watching the movie and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I think the culture. I, I'm not an expert in 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 this, and um, but my my take on it is that for a long time and prevailing in some cases you had development models which kind of just ignored culture and cultural differences and kind of like you know place differences and a bit like our high street problem you had clone you, well you have clone kind of housing estates which could be anywhere They're the same houses and the same streets but they could be in the north of england or the southwest or in different countries altogether and um and they've got no cultural distinction or differentiation from from anywhere else at all um then you've got a new wave of developers that recognizes that culture is really important that it adds value that it helps places to develop but but that seek to sort of impose cultural moves on places because they're kind of looking to do it in a in a kind of in in that kind of top down kind of controlled way that i described at the beginning and and i have a bit of an aversion to that i can, i sort of see i can see that it's important to do and kind of best, better than nothing but when you have big kind of public art interventions that are kind of placed onto a development, I just find it a bit unspontaneous and maybe not quite as authentic as it might be. So I think the next stage after that is to try, and this really talks to the to, to one of my own slides at the beginning, I think to try and really stimulate culture, it's better to, to not have a very clear idea as to what the out, what the what culture might look like in a particular place mm. try and set conditions and create spaces and opportunities for things to flourish and then step back and allow them to happen and that might be that you're making you know, you might be building flexible spaces that can be used by different people and groups and artists and so on mm. i think it's about calibrating rents so that there's accessible space mm. giving people um, access to that space uh, in a way that they can build their project uh, you know over a bit of a longer period of time and that sort of thing. So I think that as developers, we can do a lot. But I, I, I like the idea of just sort of stepping back and creating circumstances for, for, for things to flourish and happen of their own accord, rather than trying to dictate everything ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that was absolutely incredible. Um, very invigorating conversation uh, and, a, and a rare opportunity to meet um, outside, let's say, um, um, MIPIM and other, you know, real estate um, panels that cost a lot of money to actually get to. It was a really <laughs> nice, um, really, really revealing opportunity to meet two incredibly first-rate developers working in the field. Um, oh, both first rate, but thank you. Both <laughs> at least one in Surendra, <laughs> <laughs> and then I was just, I just tagged along. Yeah, but <laughs> what? You know, values are to the fore, and as I said at the outset, you know, this development Value, yeah. development to me really, if it's to be done well, it's got That's to be a balance. Nice yeah, I wouldn't mind accepting that. Close rate and values. Yeah, balancing okay. up between commercial yeah. viability and sustainability of all types, you know, environmental, social, and economic. So thank you, Prathima, and I thank you so much for um, uh, taking the time, and thank you to um, all our lovely audience. Um, I would like to say and announce that next week on the 14th of July, Tuesday, we're back again every single Tuesday and we will be focusing on, next week on sustainability strategies. And as that is also a, an awesomely big topic, we'll be returning to that again in uh, subsequent sessions. Um, we will be at uh, going live streaming live at, live at 4.30 BST, 5.30 CST, 9 p.m. IST, and what is it, 11.30 a.m. Uh, EDT. Or oh, check. people know this, people know this. You just get it on. <laughs> 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 I know this, for sure. <laughs> <laughs>
I know they do. They should know this by now. Yeah. And let me let me uh, let me just uh, announce that we have. We're very happy. We've got Tara Gibele, the architect and co-founder of Gibele Design Studio, and Julian Marwitz, who's a sustainable urban development uh, uh, specialist, founder of Arineos. So uh, we look forward to seeing you back here. Tuesday, same time, same place. And uh, please watch any of our other webinars at your leisure. So Pratima, last word. Thank you both for this really uh, fun and rich conversation. I hope we all can meet some po at some point and go have lunch and socialize like we used to. So have a great day and stay safe and we stay hope well. the audience was happy with the answers. Uh, yeah. <laughs>